I'm sure um, most of you are familiar with the situation when you walk into a room and then you stare into the wall and then you think, why did I walk into this room? So you had a plan, right? Just, just a few seconds ago, you had a plan of what to do next, but somehow you lost it. Um, so there is a special kind of memory that's supposed to keep plans like that uh, in mind, and it's called working memory. It's a very useful kind of, of memory. You use it not only to uh, remember plans and instructions, but you also use it to uh, keep in mind relevant information when you solve problems. So it's very important for uh, mathematical problem solving. And it is uh, also closely related to attention. So one way to put that is you need to remember what to focus on. So I'm going to illustrate that by, by testing your working memory here. Um, so your task here is to remember where this person is pointing so that you can point at the same boxes in the same order, okay? Okay, so now you're keeping information in working memory for positions so that you can do something based on that information, right? Easy enough. Let's have another one. So the same task, remember where this person points. Any volunteers here on the fir first row? So that's a bit harder. So this illustrates the key problem here. And the key problem is that working memory is limited. The capacity to store information is limited. And if I were to test you, you would remember roughly seven items here. And this has been termed the, the magic number seven. And it's thought to be a, a very important limit on uh, information processing ability of the human brain. Um, but um, some of you might remember eight, some of you might remember only six, so, so that's normal. But when you get an unusually low working memory, you run into problems. So children with low working memory capacity, they have problems remembering instructions of what to do next, they are inattentive, they fail uh, in mathematics, they struggle with reading comprehension. So I said we had a problem, uh, and I think I have a, a partial at least solution. So I started to study uh, the neuroscience of working memory about 20 years ago to understand uh, what's the neural basis for working memory and what's the neural basis for these capacity limitations. And one finding from our and, and others' research is that this is not a global problem all over the brain, but it seems to be restricted to uh, a set of bottleneck areas in the brain uh, and the connections between them. So here uh, seems to be uh, the, the processing ability of these regions is, is also a constitution constituting the, the limitations of work memory. But on the other hand, we know that the brain is plastic. It can change with training. It can change with experience. For example, if you look at musicians, violinists, you see the brain areas controlling uh, the, uh, the fingers, they change as a result of practice. So why wouldn't you be able to, to change these regions as well? Um, so I teamed up uh, with some computer game programmers uh, to make a program where a computer program where children could train work memory. So we want them to, to train on uh, tasks similar to the one that I showed you here. To do that uh, for uh, at least 45 minutes, that's about how long time they, they, they can manage, and do that five times a week uh, for, for five weeks. That's again about as long 
uh, as they could could manage to do this. Uh, using um, computer game like design made it slightly more motivating. Um, we also could use the computer program to adapt the difficulty level so it's close to the capacity limit. So that's a similar principle to, to when you do physical training. It's when you're close to your limits that you can actually change. Then we want to test the effect of this. And we did that in, in roughly the same way you go about when you want to try out a new drug. You have people randomized to either receiving uh, the treatment, which is the working memory training in this, uh, this study, or a, a placebo which was a computer program uh, where difficulty level was not adapted uh, to the limit of the uh, subjects. And uh, then you have psychological tests measuring working memory capacity of the children before and after. So this was a very simplistic idea. This was a neuroscientist stumbling into the field of, of working memory and treating working memory as a muscle rather than as a magical uh, black box, but it worked. So when we looked at, at the test results, we could see that children doing the training, they had actually improved the working memory capacity by roughly 20 to 15 uh, percent. And this has been replicated many times now. So the magic number seven isn't so magic after all. Then. Um, we went back to the neuroscience to look at what's happening in the brains of these subjects. And we could see that there are changes in these network regions or, or bottleneck areas. And other people have also shown that you can measure strengthening of connectivity between these regions as a result of working memory training. So we could show that uh, indeed uh, the brain uh, is plastic. So this is nice. We can push the limits. We can watch the changes that's happening in the brain. The third question is, does it matter? Does it matter for people in everyday life? One thing that, that does matter is uh, remembering plans and instructions. And we and others have now actually measured how long instructions can a child keep in mind and perform accurately? And does it change? And it does. So children going through the working memory training, they can now remember longer uh, instructions. Uh, another way to look at usefulness is actually asking parents uh, and teachers about symptoms uh, in everyday life, the behavior of the children in everyday life. Uh, about inattentiveness and if they can follow instructions. And here we're looking at uh, 13 studies that, um, that did that. So they get inattentive symptoms in the group doing the training and how that changes and in the control group and how that changes and then comparing them. If there was no effect at all, you would see a little green dot precisely at the line here. But as you see, the green dots, they end up consistently to the left, meaning here that uh, you have a uh, reduction of inattention in the training group. And if you add this up, you can see that this reduction is around half standard deviation, which is uh, pretty good. So we published the first working memory training study uh, 12 years ago. Now there are more than a hundred studies uh, published on different aspects of working memory training. Uh, and we will, you, we will uh, know, we will continue to, to, to learn about how to do working memory training, what's the best, most effective way to do this. But we already see that there is a, an effect that is useful in practice. And now we have more than 50,000 children that has benefited from working memory training in uh, more than 20 different countries. So the science tells us about the effects, but it's, it's also interesting to hear uh, from the children. And here are some comments. 
So one says that now I can remember what the teacher says. Another, before I couldn't find my stuff, I could be looking for two days. Now I can find them at once. Or I can sit and shut out the noise from around. When I read, I can focus before I couldn't do that. So this training uh, does not solve all the problems that, that these children might have but it helps them uh, keep focus. It helps them keeping a plan in mind. And that's a good start. Thank you.